thank you. So I'll talk to you about geometry of seam allowance. Uh, we've all had training from Euclid, right? And um, a point is that which has no part and a line is breadthless length, but that's only true in the platonic world. The way we draw points and lines, there is always some size to it. Um, when we draw a circle, then there's some boundary that we have with it. And I, I drew my boundaries in an exaggerated way. Uh, but that circle and that uh, square are meeting precisely. Well, their their um, boundaries overlap. And then uh, at the bottom, I have two lines intersecting, and then I want the third line to go through the intersection. In the middle, that's done correctly. In the, on the right side, well, is that correct? Up to our vision, maybe it's okay, but it's probably not. So we have this thickness in the real world when we're drawing things. But also when we're doing polyhedral construction, um, if you want to make a tetrahedron, um, well, um, you probably want to give some flaps to it and then put some glue on the flaps before you put them all together and then you have a nice tetrahedron. And then most of what I will talk about is fabric construction. There it's not sufficient to put extra just on a few sides, but you have to put extra all the way around. Now, um, in the corner, maybe on this triangle here, we really did, don't need that full triangle. Maybe we could even round it up. But cutting in the rounded way is uh, time consuming, so we usually don't do that. Maybe do a little bit of cutting here. But in general, these are in fabric construction, maybe around some of these. But if you're trying to do things fast, which in a streamlined way, which I like to do, then you probably don't do that, that much rounding. <coughs> So the question in fabric construction is what is seen at the end, what is actually used, uh, what is bought, and what is the cut piece versus finish piece. So in these red ones, the red ones is what we will see at the end, but together with the gray is what we actually cut. Okay. So um, the seam allowance, uh, so in, in the clothing, in the sewing, that extra that, and how much width we add, that's called seam allowance. And in quilting, these are quilts, the, the standard traditional seam allowance is quarter inch. For those of you in the metric world, that's seven, uh, the, in the metric world, they, they use 7.5 milliliter, millimeters. But, um, so quilting was really developed in the with immigrants in the USA, Canada, and Australia. And what they did is once they moved into the interior where there weren't any stores, they would use old clothing, old blankets, and cut them apart and make uh, further blankets from them. So it was really um, in this new world from immigrants when they were trying to make do. And in the US, we still use inches. And in Canada and Australia, they, they are on the metric system. But because most of the quilters are in the quilting world, most of the quilting rulers are in imperial units rather than uh, metric units. So quarter inch is the traditional seam allowance. When you're making clothing, quarter inch is not sufficient. You probably use 1.5 centimeters or more. Uh, in the older times in haute couture, they have even wider seam allowances because they understand that um, you will change shape over the years, and also the clothes are made to last, whereas now we have fast fashion, you throw it away tomorrow if you don't, you don't like it. But, um, and today I'll only talk to you about triangles and parallelograms, and uh, you know, I, I'm a mathematician, I like to do things, and, um, but I don't want my boss to think that I'm spending so much time on quilting, so I need to do things fast and maybe use math to say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of doing math. Um, so we start with simple rectangular grids. You have um, some area that you want to fill with <coughs> of some width and height, so a rectangle, and you want to divide it into M columns and N rows. So what you will see at the end is W times H. But uh, for each of the, um, so when each of the pieces will have um, finish size W, the whole width divided by M, times the whole height divided by n, but when you cut them, you have to add double seam allowance on each side. So the total area of cut pieces is this much, which as n gets larger and larger and m get larger and larger, 
you are buying more and more fabric. So let's do this on some numbers. Um, we start, again, I'm using imperial units here. You want a 12-inch square, and you want to grid it. Um, let's look at the red one, a 3 by 3 grid. So each of the parts will be uh, 4 by 4 inches. To add seam allowance, is 4.5 by 4.5 inches. So if you're doing a two-color quilt, so you'll have uh, five blocks of five of those squares of one color and five of another, and you'll have to buy a strip of 4.5 inches wide, and then you'll need five of those for one color and five of the other. So you'll just need 4.5 inches on one color and 4.5 of another. But if you need uh, all distinct fabrics, you'll need nine distinct fabrics, each one 4.5 inches, and then you'll need 40.5 inches. Okay. So what happens here is as you're, um, as you're gridding more and more, the size of the finished pieces gets smaller and smaller, so more and more of them fit into your uh, length that you buy in the store. So I, we're assuming that when you buy fabrics, they're all 40 inches wide. Except um, it doesn't always get smaller and smaller. When you transition from five to six by six, five by five to six by six grid, then on six by six, you need 18 blocks of each color, but even though they're smaller pieces, they don't all fit into the 40 inch width. So you'll need to buy two strips, so you, you, there's a jump there. Anyway, then the numbers keep going down for a while, and then they jump again, and then they go down again. And here, uh, for the 13 by 13, you need uh, uh, one more piece of one color than the other, and that's enough to say, oh, you need one more additional strip of the other color. Right? Whereas on the, if you use all distinct fabrics, oops, if you use all distinct fabrics, then you get outrageous amounts of, you have to buy outrageous amounts of fabric just to fill a 12 by 12 inch square quilt later. All right, so that's easy. How about um, the other way where we can uh, put mathematics into an efficiency and streamlining into quilting is how many seams are needed. So difference between seam and stitch, a stitch is when you take a needle and you put your needle down and in and through the fabric and out, that's a stitch. By machine stitching, there's top thread and the bottom thread, they each make one, that's one stitch. But by a seam, I mean here's one seam, here's one seam, here's one seam, here's one seam. Right. So I want to minimize seams, and the reason is that um, seam starting and seam stopping is prone to errors. And there's, there are two extreme events. Whereas in the middle, if all things are, in the, are identical in the middle, you may still be making errors in the middle, but it's probably consistent error. And then the final result, well, it's just your design choice that there, there's this consistent error, right? But at the beginning and the end, there are some issues. So I want to minimize the number of seams. It also prevents me from having to find all the flying pieces all over my room. Just fewer seams means fewer pieces. OK, so if you have m times n pieces, uh, with traditional piecing, it takes m times n minus 1 seams to create those. Um, and then if you, all the pieces are of different color, then you actually do need m times n minus 1 seams. But um, if you do something called strip piecing, and here it's illustrated, then you need very um, fewer. So first you just cut out strips. It's easier. Oh, by the way, there are these rotary cutters and rulers, kind of like pizza cutting, but you have a ruler so you can do it really precisely. And two inch distance, two inches plus an eighth of an inch. Um, so um, cutting strips is faster than cutting little pieces. Um, so first you sew all the strips together. Uh, so if, if you want M columns, they're M minus one seams now. And then you cut across these um, seams now. Maybe you have N, you get N rows, and then you rotate every other row, sew them together, and you have the checkerboard on the side. So you only need M minus one plus N minus one seams. Well, that's assuming that you have enough rows um, for the desired uh, uh, height checkerboard. Okay. Uh, about strip piecing, um, uh, Ernest Haight 
was probably the first one who used strip piecing, maybe already in the 1950s. He was an engineer, and at some point he complained to his wife about his mother-in-law, so her mother, not making quilts there accurately. And his wife challenged him, well, you think you can do any better? So he started quilting, and he, he was an engineer. He came up with a lot of three-dimensional puzzles, but also a lot of very new designs. And then only in the 1970s, he published a first publication about some of his methods. And also in the 1970s, about the same time, it was Barbara Johanna, um, who was really, she was a quilter, but she preferred to be designing things and thinking of shortcuts rather than actually making uh, quilts. But she also presented this strip piecing. And in fact, most of the streamlined methods that now quilters use nowadays are due to Barbara Johanna. All right, so this is strip piecing, but um, colors don't all have to be the same. So um, if you use different colors for the strips, then, well, either you sew the rows back together, well, why did you cut them apart? Or after you rotate, you get um, this quilt done in the bottom right. Okay. So that's, um, uh, keep this in mind. When you have rows, if you want to match the rows together, there are only two possible looks. One is silly, why did you cut things apart? And the other one is interesting. Um, oh, yes, so the question was if when you cut across the seams, if the seams get undone. Um, so that is, would be a problem if you used hand sewing, but with machine stitching, especially, uh, you don't even have to make it denser stitching, but it's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, if you handle them for a long time, then it could fray, but no. All right, so this is a rectangle, it's pretty easy. Let's move to triangles. All right, so you can all derive these formulas. You don't have to stare at them. So you, you want that red triangle at the end, angles alpha, beta, tip angle. I'll call that tip angle gamma. You have base, you have height. There are some connections. Finished area is a half of base times height. And cut area is this formula down at the bottom. Okay, so you can all derive that. So rather than look at that, say that we want to have equi make equilateral triangles and the seam allowance is quarter of a unit, so possibly inches. If you want the final base of this equilateral triangle to be one inch, then 71% of your cut area will not be seen at the end. It will be in seam allowance. Even for two inches base for the equilateral triangle, you will see less than 51%, uh, you will see less than 50% of the, what you cut. And then, of course, you get more and more. If you make uh, about two and a half meters wide triangle and you still use quarter, uh, quarter inch seam allowance, then 1.71% um, is what you won't see. Sounds good. But who makes triangles that are two and a half meters wide? Uh, so, um, and then uh, more about how do we cut triangles from strips? So here I have pictures of two triangles. Um, both have seam allowance, but in the second one, I chopped off the tip a little bit. So there's still a seam allowance all the way around, but I um, chopped it off a little bit. So maybe I will use less fabric with that way. Well, only maybe. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So for the top one, if I don't trim off the tops, then with that width of fabric, I get eight, uh, sorry, six triangles cut from my strip. Whereas if I do the trimmed ones, I only get seven. So um, I will have to buy a whole other strip to get the, uh, uh, sorry, only get five. I will need to buy a whole another strip to get the sixth triangle in. Another consideration for um, cutting triangles from strips is which angle do you start with? Do you start with the angle that's closer to 90 degrees or further away from 90 degrees. Well, if you start with further from 90 degrees, you get one less triangle than up here. So uh, it matters how you cut triangles, and thinking ahead is good. So um, I will tell you today how to make a rows of triangles uh, in a streamlined way. Um, the top is equilateral triangles. The next row is traditionally called half-square triangles uh, or um, 
saw, sawtooth border. The third row is also traditional. The last two are not so traditional, but hey, you can, we can make anything we want. Um, and here are some examples of rows of triangles. So I cut, I always cut the number of pieces and how many seams I needed to do. Um, here is a, a similar quilt. So the one uh, on the screen has 300 pieces. This one has um, 400 pieces more. Um, and that one had 92 seams, and this one, for more pieces, had 58 seams only. And the reason why this one has more, because here I only have 30 degrees and 90 degrees for tip angles. But there I also mixed in um, uh, 45s and was there some? 45s only. So the more variety you use, then you have to produce more what I call tubes. And here, the, the, these are rows of triangles too, but maybe they're a little hard to see. I'll give you a few seconds. Do you see rows of triangles? Yes, they're slanted like that. Yes. So these are rows of triangles and they're mirror images of each other. And the tip angles are um, arc tangent of a third. Now, arc tangent of a third is about 18.5 degrees. If I want to do, do 18.5 degrees, that's hard. But arc tangent of a third is easy for mathematicians, right? It's, yeah. All right, so let's, we want to make rows of triangles. And we will also do parallelograms. Um, we will learn about both. They go hand in hand. Um, so here is one triangle that is popping out with its implicit um, uh, seam allowance there. And if you do this, my first quilt, uh, which I did in high school, I was in high school exchange student here in Utah. For one year, I learned how to quilt here. Um, my first triangle actually used uh, a template from, made from a cereal box, and I cut, uh, marked around it with pencil on fabric, then cut out with scissors. And um, on my triangles here, you see in dashed lines the seam allowances. Well, fabric doesn't come with dashed lines on it. You have to picture it or something. So naively, you would want to do what's on that very first picture here, right? But that is not right. You really need to um, align seam allowances to seam allowances. So if I did chop off the triangles, then it would be easy. But chopping triangles uh, is hard, too. And you have to make sure you do it correctly. So um, doing these. Uh, seems one at a time um, is time consuming and maybe some of you have grandmothers or you or your mo mothers who have in the attic uh, bags or in boxes of uh, cut out pieces they, that never got finished because somebody got bored with completing this boring tedious project All right, so we want to do it fast so we don't get bored all right, so rather than doing those individual pieces, let things outside of the row. So here is the, that triangle, isolated triangle on top with seam allowance, and not, it's rotated version at the bottom, and plenty of seam allowance there between the rows. And let's do the fill in the whole row, and I also filled in magenta below it. Well, okay, let's do the same with magenta, and let's do the same with yellow, and we could keep going. So here, my red on top and blue on the bottom are triangles. Everybody else is a parallelogram. But here, crucial component is I made everybody a parallelogram. We're mathematicians. We don't, don't like special cases. If you can make one theorem, right? if uh, real numbers are not sufficient for solving all quadratic uh, equations, so we might as well add a few numbers in. Uh, uh, Affine plane is not sufficient for finding intersections of all lines, right? So let's, let's increase our space. So here, we don't like exceptions. We're adding um, these um, parallelograms everywhere. And so here's a uh, first try at making rows of triangles. So we have a lot of those crucial components. We sew them together. There's plenty of seam allowance between the rows. And then we have that waste on top and on the bottom, right? OK, we want to eliminate that waste. So rather than going to this, um, that crucial component, let's fill in the red and the blue. Let's make it go further out and then put them together. And then you may uh, sew them together. 
So rather than stopping at one, but sew them together, so now it's a tube. Um, and also, I want these tubes to be big enough so that it's comfortable to sew. It, sewing cuffs is very hard. You want big enough circumference, and then it's easy to sew as though it's a flat thing. Right? Um, so that picture, by the way, is mathematically totally correct. I took a perfect wheel. I did some projective drawing. Everything is fine. But as far as artist tradition is concerned, it's really not good. There's no shading, right? So you, can, you don't have depth. But it's describing this as a, a complete wheel. OK, so if you have a bicycle wheel, you can roll it, right? You can roll it backward. And then if you put your bicycle upside down, then you get a flop. Right, so there are all these things you can do to a tube that you cannot do to a row. If you only had a row, right? so I either sew all these rows together, or I can rotate every, every other one. That's it. But when we sew these together, we have many options. OK, and yeah, so um, these fabric things don't stay puffed up like that. They collapse. This, this is a flat view, and the rest of the pictures <coughs> Here we'll all be in flat view, and you just have to picture that there is also something in the back. <coughs> okay, so once you have a bunch of these, <coughs> how do you put them together? That very first picture, that's silly. You just cut it apart. Why would you sew them back together in the same way? <coughs> but, <coughs> and then you have some variations. Um, in the second one, I try to follow diagonal down, here diagonals up, and then the last one is pretty random. And in the top row, all of them are matching edge to edge. But in the bottom row, in all of these, there is a consistent spacing in all of them. So consistency is good. Um, is it air or is it plan? Whatever. Um, but they all have identical spacings. And here I may want to cut in between to get the rows of triangles here. I can cut at this other angle here, at the other angle here, probably also horizontally. Um, so the tip of the triangles is determined by how we constructed this tube from which we cut the narrow tubes. But the other two angles are determined by this spacing. Okay. So, um, so on the left side is what I call parallelograms. That's where we do point to point. And on the right side, we'll be making rows of triangles. And the visible distance, so here in, this, in the purple picture, the, it's not point to point. There's extra width. And when we make a cut through that way, there is double seam allowance. Um, in the way, so, in the way, so that we, we can make accurate um, tri uh, rows of triangles. All right. So um, there are some technical terms here. When I have two of these tubes, how do we sew them together? So to make overall parallelograms, I, we want what I call finished shift zero. So there is no shift between the points. And the way to accomplish them before the tubes are sewn together, we want at seam allowance, this point to be in the same uh, height as the at seam point here. So the way we do that, uh, we have, those of us who see seam allowance a lot, we just internalized it. So you pin, before you sew them, you stick a pin through the top, stick a pin on the bottom, and then you sew. Edge shift zero is even easier to sew. So just add these seams along the edges. They should be together, so you don't have to do any measurements. Just so, so, so. But any other shifts, and for triangles of other angles, uh, you will need to do shifts. There you have to do some consistent mark markings everywhere. And I have an efficient way of mark making these markings. And then you want to match the marking in one to the edge seam on the other. And when you sew them, see this point here is higher than that point here. That's why we have this gap here. And there's a formula for uh, what, where the markings have to be. OK. So um, we'll work through this uh, uh, quilt of triangles. <laughs>
So there are seven rows of equilateral triangles, width is equal to six bases. So what's the proportion of height to width? Well, it's just about one. Um, and um, you surely can all see a square. Well, there, there are hum there's human error there, so, um, but it's pretty much a square. Um, so how do we do that? We start with a strip set. I did bring one here um, in case you want to see, oh, in case you want to see one in person. Um, when you sew these strips together, some strips are longer than others, so the other uh, sides doesn't necessarily uh, correspond, but at the top, these shifts are, um, you take the width of your strip, subtract double seam allowance, and then multiply by cotangent of the tip angle. For 45 degrees, that's easy, right? For um, 60 degrees, like here, well, then you have to, maybe the number is something like 1.73. How do you convert that to inches? Well, you do one is fine. 73, you multiply by 32, and then round, uh, sorry, 0.73, you multiply that by 32, round it, and that's how many 30 seconds you can measure. So those of you who have never seen an imperial ruler, they're inches and eighths of an inch. There's no 0.73 of an inch on a ruler. So they're eighths of an inch, and then you can eyeball halfway between eighths of an inch to get sixteenths, and you can eyeball the imaginary space sixteenths and eighths to get 30 seconds of an inch. That's as far down as I can go. Um, and it does matter because especially when your angles are very acute, even if you are shortchanging yourself on the 30 seconds of an inch, it could make a big difference of how the pieces fit together later. All right, once you sew the strips together, then you press and you cut at accurate 60 degrees in this case. And then you sew the two outside strips together. So pretend I made this cut here, and then I just sewed the, I mean, why am I showing this to a group of people who is pretty much topologists, right? You do these identifications all the time of sides, right? So what you get is, okay, this is an inside out, it's a tube. You get a tube. So this is a tube, three-dimensional tube. Uh, well, it looks like two-dimensional tube. And then you cut um, one of these, what I call primary wide tubes into primary narrow tubes, and I had an example. And uh, you can calculate ahead of time how many of these you will get from where you started. You can observe here that I got there are seven. So you sew them all together with that shift. This is not edge shift zero, it's not finish shift zero, so I had to do some measuring. And then once you have this tube, then you cut through one of the swaths and you get this parallelogram. We're almost ready to make rows of triangles, except that we want to be streamlined. And um, so one thing that, what we could do is just make all the other cuts across, so then we would get slanted rows of triangles. I want square rows of triangles, I don't want slanted ones. So one way of fixing it is that I could then sew this edge to that edge, and then make rectangle, but remember, uh, beginnings and ends are prone to you know, hand-eye coordination mistakes, so we don't want to cut and then make those individual seams. All right, we can do better than that. Before, before I get into that, I will do an interlude. So here I'm showing how to make rows of triangles. Let's go back to parallelograms where it's easier. Okay, so we'll have an interlude now of, uh, hold this in mind, we'll come back to this side, this page, but, um, we're now making all over parallelograms. So on the first picture shows a tube for parallelograms, so it's all edge to edge. Um, then first cut across gives us a parallelogram. The cut uh, piece uh, parts are top and bottom. And then I make a cut perpendicular to that last cut. That's a third picture. And then I sew the left edge to the right edge, and I get that final quilt. So, that was 17 seams, 83 pieces. And then you can put this into a quilt here, the first quilt. Now, you might be observant and say, well, look at that top uh, right white, what's supposed to be a parallelogram. It has both its right and its top corner chopped off. That, it went into the seam allowance, right? So, well, let's go back. <clears throat> 
In this construction, if I made the blue strips wider than everybody else, then the, everywhere else there would be just point to point sewing uh, of these parallelograms. But the blue ones, there would be uh, extra um, space there. So I could cut in that extra space. And then at least at the top and the bottom, I wouldn't have the blunting of the, the points there on the parallelograms. As far as the sides are concerned, one way of not allowing that to happen, I could have done um, this cut here that I did in the third picture. I could have done it a little to the side and on the other side, so then I would waste a little bit in the middle, uh, but at least I wouldn't have this problem here. So um, that extra width is demonstrating here in the middle quilt. Um, so the, there you have to rotate in 90 degrees for this. The, the, the fabric on the extreme left and extreme right, the other way for you, um, those, that fabric was cut wider so there's no blunting of points uh, along the left and right edges, but there's still blunting at the top and the bottom. So if that bothers you, well, you have to do some other cutting. If it bothers you, how about make a design where it doesn't matter where you cut, right? So, all right. Um, I also have to show this one. This is a curvature blindness illusion due to Kosuke Takahashi. All the curves here are identical, but the color makes the top um, rail fence be jig zigzag, zigzag, kind of abrupt. And then the next uh, two are curvier. And then the next are zigzag, zigzag, and then curvier, even though they're all the same. But it's just the color gives this illusion. All right, so back to two piecing of, of a rows of triangles. So remember when we had, uh, if this were parallelograms, we just made a perpendicular cut there. But if I make a per perpendicular cut there, I will be cutting through some triangles, and uh, that won't be good. So we don't want to do that. So what we really have to do is what I call slitting. So rather than cut um, all the way from one edge to the other edge of that parallelogram, I cut to within half an inch or so of the edges. And now this is a whole edge, that's a whole edge, and I sew them together just like in the bottom picture. Huh? So it's just one easy seam, as the same as before. It does have a beginning and end, whereas the, when I was sewing the other narrow tubes together, there was no beginning and ending. Where's my tube? I lost it. Oh, here it is. So when you sew two of these together, there's no beginning and end, but when you have some cutting on it, then Yes, there is one beginning and one end, but not 16 of them. Right? So once you do this slitted sewing, then you extend the slits into full cuts, and we got eight of these secondary narrow tubes. I only need seven for my quilt. So then I sew these seven narrow tubes together, and then I make one cut, and I don't know if you can tell from the back of the room, but the cut is, uh, quarter of an inch away from um, a set of vertices on, and also on the other side so that when I add seam allowance, allowance all the way around, I won't be chopping any corners. Okay, so there are some formulas for two, yeah, that's, we don't need to read that. Uh, how about how many seams are needed uh, for a top with end rows of triangles of width equal to M basis of triangles? Um, so if, no, if angles are obtuse, then you well, then you have to shift things. So uh, let's assume that no angles are obtuse. Then each row has two M plus one triangles, so the whole quilt, quilt has two M plus one times N pieces. And so the whole quilt requires, well, that many minus one seems with traditional piecing. So attic, those, all those projects in the attic, that could be a lot if M is large. Um, but with two piece, the two piecing method, um, it's pretty much linear in the number of rows and the number of triangles per row. All right, so let's look at another triangle. Uh, so earlier we had um, uh, six bases and seven rows. Now we have 15 rows 
width equal to 13 basis and the proportion of height to width is just about one, but a little on the short side. Previous ratio was a little bit bigger. So if you've seen continued fractions, um, this, um, uh, what was it, seven over six and 15 over 13, they all come in the uh, continued fraction expansions and then um, uh, their, uh, what do you call, convergence uh, when you do square root of three over two. Okay. All right, so what have we covered so far? a very streamlined construction of rows of parallelograms and triangles. Uh, and temporarily, we have to move into the th third dimension, uh, three into the third dimension to be more efficient, to be able to mix the colors better, um, get all these uh, projects here. Um, we, that also enables minimization of needed seams, greater accuracy, I mean, if, if um, it's, or at least consistent accuracy, and then it's just a different design. And then one, Issue could be we may have point gobbling along uh, all or two of the final edges. Trimming is a possible solution. And then also I talked about uh, continued fractions and height to row proportions. And especially if you have a quilt, but you need to make it bigger so that it will fit on somebody's bed, you may need to add borders, but you want borders maybe to be made of triangles. Well, do you want to, if you want to have, uh, I don't know if proportion is, uh, 17 over divided by 83. Do you really want to make 17 pieces on one side and 83 on the other? Like, you know, that's a lot. Okay, so for the next bit, I want to talk about um, no gobbling of points and no trimmings on any side. All right, so um, this is one quilt I brought here. Um, the quilt, the pattern, uh, oh, by the way, in quilting, many of the blocks have traditional names. Um, so that, uh, the one in the middle is called Grandmother's Garden. The one by ones, which are typically on a, um, on a square, uh, this is called economy block. Um, if, what? It came back, okay. Um, Anyway, uh, we don't need to know the blocks, but I just call them one by twos, four by twos, three by twos, three by threes, three by twos, like, it's obvious what I mean. And the same method works for all. You don't need to buy instruction booklets for each of those numbers. And then my very similar method also what I call split P by Q blocks. So in the P by Q blocks, all the corners are of the same color or they're of one color. But in split P by Q blocks, the corners uh, have two colors come in. So um, these blocks here, that's um, according to my terminology, this is a split one by one block. And a more traditional name for it is half square triangle and it's maybe more descriptive if... Um, so in this particular block, there are four half square triangle blocks of uh, size 16 inches four squared of size eight inches, four cubed of size four inches, four to the fourth of size two inches, and four to the fifth of size uh, one inch. That's a total of 2,728 triangles. That would be a lot. Um, and so with traditional uh, methods, this would take 2,727 seams. I did it with 157 seams. Um, and this is one of the few quilts that has a name. I call it sedimentation. Big rocks on top, the smaller ones percolate down to the bottom. Okay. Um, so here I'll just get a, give a scheme of how I do these. The seam allowances between the blocks are exaggerated. Um, but, and I have color, color coding to explain to me the role of what each one is playing and makes it, the construction easier. But in general, probably my blocks um, the, all the, there's a green color and all the other colors will all be white, but the other colors here are just for my construction purposes. Okay, and here are the split blocks here. Um, um, so here I exaggerated the seam allowance, but sometimes there is still um, uh, some, uh, for, I, I can minimize some waste, but not in other directions. So I do have leftovers. I'll talk about leftovers in a little bit. And by the way, also there are some trimmings when I 
take a strip set and I have to trim and then I cut out so many of the primary narrow tubes and there will be some leftover. So yes, I do have lots of leftovers and what do I do with them? Oh well. Okay, there are some formulas here. All right, uh, that Cupid's triangle, Cupid's darts that I showed you earlier, let's quickly go through the construction of that. So tip angle, as a member, is arctangent of a third. Um, so here's one of them, and I cut this primary narrow tube into six. Uh, uh, I cut one primary wide tube into six primary narrow tubes, and I did it twice, plus another construction like this. Um, and um, and in the other one, well, actually, I ran out of the dark blue fabric, so, oh well. Um, and then I sewed all of those together. Um, and then I made a mirror image of that. And then I made cuts through the two of them. And then I did those splits. In each one of them, I did the uh, slitting. And then I sewed the two bottom edges to the top edges. And then I extend the slits into full cuts, and then I get eight secondary narrow tubes. And then I sew the eight secondary narrow tubes into something like this. And then I have to make a cut across to make, get this parallelogram. And then, well, if I do a perpendicular cut that doesn't, that avoids enough things, then um, uh, I do this, put them together, and then I have to do a few more cuts and adjustments so that I get a rectangle. Okay. So that's how uh, the, that Cupid's darts was made. And next I want to explain that uh, sine wave quilt. In um, 2018, the theme at PCMI was harmonic analysis. Um, and at that time, PCMI always occurred across the 4th of July, so we would participate in the 4th of July um, parade. We would march down the street, and this was an entry. Um, we held it up high. Um, and so what you see there, the, the, you can imagine that this part here was connected to that, this to that, this to that, and so on. So this was part of a tube, and I made a cut across the tube, and then I had to fill in those entries. So here's a tube. I'm going backwards. Here are the primary narrow tubes of different widths. Here's the primary wide tube, and here's a strip set. That pale blue fabric is much wider. And um, the seams needed for the wave construction uh, are, um, there are 1,131 pieces, 122 seams. Um, proportion of the visible area to what I cut is 51%. And proportion of visible to bot is uh, not yet, not quite 50%. All right, so um, I explained all the pieces here. Um, if you feel it, um, there you can, you can do, you do feel quilts. And then especially um, here, the seam allowance is not much proportion here, but it's quite a bit here. So this quilt is quite a bit heavier down there. So it's perfect for your feet. Yeah? Your feet are usually colder than your top, right? So um, it's much heavier down here. And yes, there's quite a bit of bulk here, too. You can feel it. <coughs> Other questions? Yes? Yeah. I never thought about it. Maybe Henry can think about it. Possibly in fourth, with fourth dimension, I'd be able to make curvier things. I don't know. Would, would, your, would your stitches stay, stay together if it, if it uh, I don't know anything about the fourth dimension. <laughs> I, but, okay. So um, in the rest, so there are trimmings. Everywhere I go, there are trimmings. Um, so what do I do with scraps? I make more quilts with them. So um, 
Yeah, so this is just lying on the floor. It's not, so but what is a quilt? Um, so the quilt has the, the, this front part, and then it has a backing, um, and then there's also the middle part that gives you warmth. So that's, it's called batting. Um, sometimes it's old blankets. I like to use cotton or uh, wool. Some people use polyester. Um, there's also uh, bamboo. There are all sorts of materials you can put in between, and you can make it arbitrarily thick. This, what's on the floor right now, is only the top part. Uh, but for some reason, I have affinity to these scrappy quilts made from what I call brownish fabrics, even though they're not all brownish, but they give me like a feel of brown. Okay. And um, so what I do is I, and this is very relaxing. Like some of these quilts, I, I have to focus, right? Or like uh, I, I always calculate ahead of time. So it's for efficient use of fabric and my time. So I, I make uh, calculations ahead of time so that if I need eight tubes, I will get eight tubes. Uh, and if I need 16, so I will not be wasting too much fabric uh, and my time. So, um, but for these projects, these leftover projects, there's, uh, there's no thinking there. It's just if I need some time to just do nothing, I'll go down there in my sewing area and um, just put next piece on, put, add next piece on. All right. So I make these six and a half inch wide blocks and then eventually I sew them into rows and then sometimes I set them um, in, on the grid and sometimes diagonally and um, here I made tubes so I'm, I sewed the rows together and then sewed the two outside rows together and then did the pressing and so now this is a tube and when later remember when, whenever you have a tube if you cut across then you get a rectangle, oh, sorry, you get a parallelogram, and then you can do some perpendicular cutting and eventually rectangulate. So this, first making a tube, and then making cutting at various angles, um, uh, and then sewing the, uh, rectangulating that, allowed for better visibility than if I first made a rectangle, cut across, sewed other pieces, because our pressing matters too. If you have, um, if I had a seam here and there, when they come together here, I would want seam allowance and one be up and the other one down. So I, that would be harder to achieve if I didn't make a tube first. Okay. And then the other thing that I've been, uh, I haven't made enough, um, a quilt that's big enough for this, so I'm not showing it. But some idea is like, okay, I'm bored, bored with just making those grids or rectangles. So how about radial placement of rows? So here I did some playing. So maybe how about um, start with the bases of four, and then you add in, bet add in between the next four, and here add in between the next eight, and then add in between the next um, 16. So I could keep filling it in. Uh, in this one, the base is, was six, right? Uh, no, was it six? Yeah, six hexagon in the middle. And then add extra rows in between. This does require extra thinking, uh, but hey, it's, um, maybe I'm tired of boring quilts, even though I like them. And then here is uh, another idea. Um, so here, I pretty much completed it, but then theoretically, I said, well, I want to add the next 32 or whatever number in, but theoretically, they will fit in only up there. So in practice, I would want to add them in. So, well, I probably should have made all these other rows longer, so that's what I did here. But I don't mind this theoretical construction. I'll just add more fabric there. So this is uh, some ideas for how I could be using my leftover blocks. Um, but then I thought, well, why should all my rows be the same width? Um, if you have different widths, then you mess up your proportions and uh, you have to think really hard your, how you're putting them together. Okay, I'll stop here. If you're interested more, I have a YouTube channel and a website and um, on Instagram and Facebook. You can see more. And feel free to come up here and touch the quilts.